because you do have perfect attendance so far this year. So that's always good to do. Um, a couple of things I wanted to just mention to you. In our bulletin, there's lots of announcements. I'm not going to go through uh, all of those. But I did want to mention just a couple things. One has to do with our 
um, church business meeting that will be coming up in 10 days. Um, as you know, this is the beginning of a new year, so everything is a clean slate. But uh, you've been tracking with us how things um, finished on the year 2017. There's going to be bad news, but it's okay news kind of thing. Um, we did, there were three findings particularly that we were looking at in our, uh, our giving that were really running behind. And um, all three of them did not quite make uh, our goal for the year or our, our, our needs. But uh, we're okay, so don't panic on that. And there's plans and there's ways that we're going to be okay. Um, our general fund finished just a few, a couple thousand behind. Our um, foreign mission was about 1,400 behind. Um, although we, we sent out the checks and all that kind of stuff. And so that's bad news that um, basically our the missionaries that are out of the country that we support got $90 less than what we were going to give to them, what we were hoping to give to them. That's the bad news. The okay news is that it was still $30 more than the year before we were going to give to them. So, uh, so it depends on which side of the empty or full cup you want to look at. And then our uh, written cares came up short about $700. But some of those we'll be able to make up throughout this year, we hope, and some other plans, so that'll be good. Just wanted to mention that to you. Uh, if you want to know a whole lot more detail, uh, that'll be all hit and discussed in the plans and all that will go over in our uh, annual business meeting in 10 days. Uh, also wanted to mention that Dora Spiegler is going to have some outpatient surgery on Tuesday. I know that she would really appreciate your prayers for that. And then also, uh, our missionary week this week is the Andy Royer family. Uh, many of you have asked uh, a couple things. One is, I have in there that they're in Wisconsin. You would say, wait a minute, aren't they one of our foreign missionaries in Brazil? That's true. Uh, they've been relocated to Wisconsin this year to do the same thing they were doing down there. What they do is they teach and they train pastors and church leaders who then go out to very isolated areas. When they were in Brazil, uh, the ones they trained went down the Amazon and into the jungles to places where no one has heard the gospel before, and they tried to reach people and start churches. So that's what they do. They train the people who go do that. Um, the place in Brazil, the school in Brazil, did not have the quantity of students this year, the number of students. So. They asked um, Andy and Sarah and the boys to move up to Wisconsin because they have a place, a training center in Wisconsin that sends people not just to Brazil but all around the world. Same exact concept, but that's where they, uh, that's where they're at for this school year. We'll see where God leads them next school year. Um, also, some of you know that about two weeks ago, Andy had some surgery. He's been having trouble with. Um, it's really a blood pressure kind of thing, varicose veins that causes a drop of blood pressure. It passes out a lot. And, um, and so that can be a problem when you're in class and you pass out and kind of panics the students a little bit. And so he had some surgery about two weeks ago. Uh, he still has been experiencing the passing out, but they told him it could be five or six months before he really sees the full result of all that. So. Um, so keep praying for them. That's you know several things there. One is just their ministry, what they're doing. Uh, he's got a couple weeks off of school, so uh, but he's able to get around now. And then um, then also just for their health issues. And Sarah has ongoing health issues, as so does their oldest son Miles too. So lots of things to be praying for for them. So we appreciate that. Something we're going to be doing throughout this, um, especially the early part of this year, is we're going to spend a couple minutes just focusing on one of the ministries here at the church. Uh, we were talking and, and we realized that no one here really knows everything that goes on. And so we thought there's some pretty neat things that are going on and we'd like to introduce you to some of that. And uh, today we're going to have uh, Joe and Jamie are going to share with us about what we just call our junior church program and, and what's going on there. One of the things you're going to find out throughout these weeks 
is a lot of what we do has um, a team concept of people coming together and working together and, and doing this. We're very few things that we have as somebody stand alone. Uh, we really prefer to have teams of people working together. And uh, as much as we can possibly do, although we're not great at this, we try to train and prepare you for that. But the other aspect is uh, we like to give opportunities for people to serve as well. So I'm going to try to find a mic that I hope is working and give it to uh, Jill and Jamie and let them uh, just share what's going on in their ministry here. So thank you. No. <laughs> um, Joe and I are downstairs often with our children's ministry. We work with the school age students from kindergarten through fifth grade. And they are all up in the balcony right now. <laughs> um, there's a couple things we wanted to show you. We, each week, we are downstairs. We use the orange media. It's um, 252 Kids is the curriculum that we use. There's a monthly theme. Um, that was the first slide. Then each week has a bottom line. The bottom line is whatever the students are focusing on for that week. And then this slide here is our um, monthly Bible verse. They have a monthly Bible verse that they memorize. And they earn um, stickers. Power Bucks. Thank you, Zavi. <laughs> um, for memorizing these verses and bringing back, they have what's called God Times. And each uh, Sunday they go home with the God Times that has like four weeks worth, or I'm sorry, four nights worth of uh, just a little Bible verse application for what they've learned that week that they can go home and do with their parents and bring back. And if it comes back to us, then they earn Power Bucks towards um, rewards for completing these types of things. Eight. The program that we have provides the teachers with a scripted lesson to follow. It gives the games, it gives the activities. It's a wonderful resource to us downstairs. Um, the first hour that we're together uh, during Sunday school, we have a Bible story video with activities. And then during the second hour, we, um, the, all the students come upstairs in the balcony. We participate in the church service for worship songs and offering um, greetings we feel that it's important that our students are also learning the hymns and being a part of church service. And then we go back downstairs and we watch an application video and do some more activities that applies the learning that we're focusing on for that week. Um, who is involved in the leading? will be the next bullet point on our paper here. And it's Jamie and I, uh, Dan and Ashley and Dustin and Rachel. We, uh, each take a month and then spend four weeks with the kids and then we work our way through so we're not, we try not to have one couple um, out of church for very long. Uh, this used to be a four week rotate, or four month rotation and it's now a three month rotation. So we are employing anybody that feels led to please step forward and we'll be glad to train you. Um, there's about eight to 12 students on a consistent basis depending on the week. Uh, and like she said earlier, it's a K through five age group. Okay. Um, like Joe said, we are currently on, a, there's three couples that do this. So we're on a four month rotation. When Austin and Eric were here, we each had three months through the year because there were four of us. So if anyone does feel that, we would greatly appreciate any support of adding um, another person to this rotation. Our curriculum is paid through our youth fund, and we just wanted to tell you how grateful we are for that, how much we appreciate the church support for our youth. Um, there, it is a cost. It's a cost for us to have the videos and to have the curriculum, but our students have a very clear focus for the month, and we are grateful for that. Um, our last bullet point is that we just want to say we appreciate you, the time that you have taken to raise strong Christian children in our church. And we would welcome any help and support in growing our youth ministries. Thank you. I also wanted to make one other thing really clear. When I said that we're not good at training them, I was pointing at myself. <laughs> they do a great job. I, I really don't. So uh, we appreciate so much um, the three people that all do that. And like she said, they're 
plenty of room for others to join in and, and help out. So thank you. Continue our worship time. We invite you to take a hymnal and uh, stand. Turn to page 405. <laughs> so much for your love and your grace. Today we come to just adore and worship you. And we do that through our Savior, Jesus, in his name. Amen. As we're taking the offering, we invite you to turn to page 400 in your hymnals. And you will sing the hymn, I Want to Be Like Jesus.
I'd like to ask if you are able to please stand for the reading of God's word. I'll be reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. Paul and Silvanus and the Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and our Father, knowing the brethren beloved by God is choice of you. For our gospel did not come to you in the world only, word only, but also in power and the Holy Spirit and full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith towards God has gone forth, so we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you, and how you turn to God from idols and serve the living and true God. And to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Let's pray. Our kind Heavenly Father, the things that we've said, the things that we've heard, the words that we've sung, we want these to be true in our hearts. Lord, we want to be more like Jesus as a church, as individuals in our Christian lives. Lord, we're so thankful for your forgiveness and your grace. Lord, we also want to pray for those who couldn't be here this morning, whether in nursing homes or ill. Lord, help them who are discouraged, give them your grace and your peace. Father, for those who are here this morning who bear burdens that we know nothing about, again, we pray that these burdens would cause their faith to grow and trust in you. Lord, you're sovereign in every detail of our lives. Help us to have wisdom and understanding of that. We thank you for this warm building. We thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you. We thank you for your word that is pure, that is holy, that is true. Father, thank you for the message that you have for us this morning. We pray as we open our hearts to you, please speak to our hearts. Lord, help us to learn to be more like Jesus. Amen. So today we're going to begin a new study, and it's from the uh, letter that Paul wrote, I dropped my recorder, um, from uh, First Thessalonians. I love this book. This is one of my favorites in the New Testament. John, the Gospel of John is my favorite. I just can't deny that. But I really love First Thessalonians. When I was in seminary, um, you have to take courses in Greek. And, um, and so I was looking through what, what ones I would take, and, and I took a course in First and Second Thessalonians. And that's really good, um, except for there were uh, five of us in the class. Now, if you've ever been in a class that is two hours long, and there's only five of you in there, even I can't hide in a class like that. And so. Um, so we got picked on a lot. The professor was, um, his, his name is uh, Richard or Dick Mayhew, um, good guy, really good guy. You don't know him. He's a great spreading guy. Um, he ended up for the last literally 40 years, you know what he's been doing? He's done something that all of you have been probably impacted by, but you didn't know that. He is the right hand man for John MacArthur does a lot of his background studies and all that stuff. He's the vice president of the seminary, college and seminary that MacArthur's at. And so a lot of the material you'll see MacArthur does, some of it um, uh, Prop Mayhew has been a part of. And a couple of years ago, I, I do things with the National Ministerium. I had some stuff up, and one of them is honoring guys. And, and uh, so we honored him for his 40 years of service with us uh, through the Grace Brethren Ministries. 
And he was so thrilled. And he sent me an email and, and thanked me. And, and, and I wrote back and told him you know, how much I really appreciated his ministries and, and how much I enjoyed the class. You know, I was probably, uh, there were five of us in the class. I think I ranked sixth in that class. Mm. And, um, and so anyhow, uh, next thing I knew, I got a package in the mail, and it was a commentary that he wrote on First and Second Thessalonians. So I, it's been about 30 years since I taught through this, and I've always wanted to do it again. So uh, you get to go through that here for the next bunch of weeks. This uh, series of First Thessalonians will take us up to uh, Easter, actually, if everything goes right. No snow days. No freezing cold days like today. Uh, and as long as all the electric and heat works, we'll be able to get them all in. Got to give you some background. Background is mostly found in Acts chapter 17. You can read that later. But you're going to find out that um, the city of Thessalonica and the church that was there was founded during Paul's second missionary journey. He had three times when he went out and started visiting cities and, and starting churches in different places. This was the second trip that he made. Uh, and on this particular trip, he took with him Silas and Timothy, or Silvanus is what it is said in the, in the one, and that's actually really the Greek name for him, uh, Silvanus. And uh, he, he took them with him. He separated the first journey that he did, he did with Barnabas was one of them, but they separated. They had a little bit of a church conflict over whether or not John Mark should go with them, and uh, they decided to go separate ways and have two teams of missionaries instead of one, which was good. If you remember um, from the book of Acts, what was called the Macedonian Call, where Paul was heading uh, north and, and east, and all of a sudden, uh, he had a vision of, a, of an individual who was from Macedonia and said, no, don't go north and east, go north and west, and we need you here. And he followed that call. And as a result of going north and west into Macedonia, the church in Thessalonica was founded. Uh, it probably happened around the year 49 AD. And um, if this letter that we're going to be studying through was written months later, maybe even as much as a year later, in the year 50 or maybe 51 AD. So it's going to tell us about a young, struggling church that's trying hard to survive in an extremely dangerous world. Thessalonica was a, a, an attractive commercial center. It was a very diverse city. It had uh, Roman citizens. There was lots of Gentiles and Greeks there, and also had a pretty large population of Jewish people that were there. It was three miles in from the sea, uh, the Aegean Sea. It was a little inlet, so it was a major seaport. So there was a lot of trade that went on there, a lot of uh, people traveling in and out, uh, and it was a pretty neat city. It also, Macedonia would have been the big area, like we would think of uh, a large state. And, and uh, Thessalonica became the capital of Macedonia for the Roman Empire. So it was the city that the Roman government saw as their main one in this area. Population, at that time, probably about 200,000. So I don't know where we can relate that to. Is that what Akron is? I don't think that's that big even, but you know, a pretty big city. Well, in Acts chapter 17, it tells us that Paul uh, was there and the first three Sabbath days, the first three Saturdays, he had a tradition. He did this every town he went to. He would go to the synagogue and meet with the Jewish people and speak with them and talk to them. And he would, uh, he would share a message, and his message had to do with the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, Acts 17 tells us that he would go and show the people how Jesus had to suffer and rise from the dead. So that was his main thrust. That's what he would talk about. He did that for three consecutive Saturdays. He had some very good fruit come out of that. Um, people who got saved, some of them were the ethnic Jews. 
uh, obviously some of the Jewish people really responded, the God-fearing proselyte Greeks. Those were people who had converted to Judaism, but they were not ethnic Jews. They were Greeks and, and Gentiles. And the scripture Acts tells us that not a few women, that probably means a bunch of women, and it also had the uh, adjective saying, not only were women getting saved, but these were prominent women. These were probably well-to-do, well-educated, uh, maybe business-related type people. And I added the word pagans because they were just pagans there too. So, um, so Paul would go in and he would speak and teach in the synagogue for at least three weeks before he would turn to the Gentiles. But he did turn to the Gentiles at some point and apparently had some pretty successful time. Most scholars believe that Paul spent between three and six months in Thessalonica. He was there for a little bit of a while. I'm gonna tell you why I think he was there that long. Probably, I think more toward the six months. Here's a couple reasons why. One is that they received offerings in Thessalonica that came from Philippi. So they had to start the church, have a measure of success, and then hear about the needs, and then all that money had to get from Philippi. And, and back then, the Western Union service wasn't that good. And so they had to get that money back and forth, and they received a couple offerings. I think it would have took some time. Also, Paul will reference in, in here that um, he had worked both night and day trying to be, maintain his uh, needs. He didn't want to be a burden to the people in Thessalonica. So uh, for him to be there long enough that he had needs, etc., I think he had to be there a little longer. But probably the best reason why I think is because as you see this letter, um, he develops a really deep pastoral care relationship with these people. He cared about them very deeply, and I don't think that happens overnight either. So I think he was there for a while. He was also there long enough that the Jewish um, people who did not accept his message became jealous and envious of him, and they tried to do everything they could to discredit Paul. So envision that. There's a synagogue that's probably flying pretty good. And Paul comes in, starts teaching about Jesus and the resurrection and why he did that. And people are getting saved. And Paul's gathering them together into a cluster or a community or a church. And some of the Jewish people who did not accept this, and maybe they were those in power or whatever, uh, they didn't like that. It was disrupting their ministry. So they started to do everything they could to disrupt his ministry. In fact, Acts tells us that they rounded up some bad characters, I don't know what that means, but it sounds cool, from the marketplace. You know, there in Thessalonica, would, all those cities had marketplaces, and those who maybe were without work, or those who were a little bit suspicious would hang around there. And it tells us that they formed a mob and tried to start a riot and blame it on Paul. They ultimately went to the house of one of the new Christians, a guy named Jason, and they went to his house because they were looking for Paul and Silas and Timothy, and they wanted to have him arrested. He wasn't there. So they took Jason into custody, and it tells us that they were trying to put charges against Paul. The charges would have been things like he tried to start a revolution, there was treason, sedition, and all these kinds of things against Paul. And so, because Jason harbored Paul and his team for a while, they arrested Jason, and they held him for security. And uh, eventually, he had to post bond to get out. And they told everybody that this Paul caused trouble all over the world. In the middle of the night, Paul and his team leaves, and, and they go on farther away. And at some point in the future, months later probably, uh, Paul sends Timothy back to Thessalonica to see how's it going there. Are they okay? Are they staying true to Jesus? Uh, you know, we know they're getting persecuted. How are they holding up? And Timothy comes back 
and tells Paul all about it. By the way, Paul went up to Corinth. And so while he was there, Timothy comes back and starts telling Paul all about this glowing report about a great, I would use the word model, church of new believers that are really on fire and are doing great things. And as a result of that report, Paul writes a letter, and the letter is 1 Thessalonians. That's, boy, that took a while to get there, didn't it? So we're there. Okay, so we're in 1 Thessalonians. And I'm going to suggest that the first couple verses, maybe one through four, are just describing about the birth and the growth of the church. It starts like a very typical letter. It has three parts to it. It has the writer, it has the recipients named, and it gives a greeting. Paul, Silas, Timothy, to the church of Thessalonica, grace and peace to you. Paul, you know, he was, his one name uh, was Saul, and then he was uh, used his second name, Paul, uh, once he got saved. The name Saul means asked for, as if somebody requested him. But the name Paul means small. And people speculated what he looked like. Someone found a description that was written of someone, uh, we, I don't know who the writer was, but he was somebody contemporary of that age that wrote a description of Paul. Here's what it said. A man of small stature with a bald head and crooked legs in a good state of body, I think that means round, with eyebrows meeting, okay, Unibrow, and, and a nose somewhat hooked, full of friendliness, for now he appeared like a man, and now he had the face of an angel. So basically, this was a really bad looking guy who was friendly enough that this writer said, you know, he may have looked like a man, but sometimes he looked like an angel. He was so friendly and so nice. Wouldn't you just love history to record that for you? So Silas and Timothy were with them. For Timothy, this was his first ministry trip. And this is where he goes, to Thessalonica. And he's at a church, which means called out. They were called out from um, worshiping idols. And he, he greets them with a title, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord speaks about his deity. Jesus uh, is the babe that we celebrate that was born, became a human man. And, and saved us from our sins, Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One. And he grants them grace from God and peace with God. And he says to them in, in verse 3 that he's thankful for three things about them. He, he's thankful for faith that works, a love that labors, and hope that endures. That's pretty good stuff. Their, their faith was effective and it worked for them. It, it was carrying them through. And because of their faith in Christ, um, they grew in their love. They had this uh, compassion for people. And they, it caused them to serve and to do things. And they had the hope that endures. We're going to see throughout this letter, uh, there's an awful lot of explanations of prophecy in this in this letter, probably clearer than in other places, so it's kind of exciting to talk about. But just that hope that is out there, that Christ is in control and he's going to come again someday and, and make everything right, and he's going to change uh, the way the world is going. Uh, that is just a wonderful hope that Christians have been clinging to for a long time. Those, verse, those phrases about his, uh, his faith, his love, his endurance, his hope, uh, reminds me, we have a theme for our year. It's in our bulletin. Uh, we keep that theme all the time, the passion for God and compassion for people. As you know God and you learn more and more about him, you cannot help but to have a, an offshoot of loving and caring about people and trying to help their needs. And that's what they were doing in their early church. They weren't even Christians a year yet. And they were being well known for this. Paul tells them that uh, he mentions them often in his prayers. And um, 
That's probably going to be true because 13 times in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2nd, or 1 Thessalonians and 2nd Thessalonians, he will talk about prayer. In verse 4, he tells them that God chose you. He says, for we know, brothers, by God, that he has chosen you. Now that brings up a whole study of uh, how we get saved, who initiates what, and uh, the doctrine of election. So I did you a great favor by putting a whole bunch of Bible verses in, the, in your outline that you can go home and study later today. And when you have the definitive answer on how this all works in the mind of God and in the, in the life of believers, then you can write a book and straighten all the rest of us out. That would be great. But I did want to give you a quote that uh, I think is pretty good. Election is that act of God in which, before the foundation of the world, he chose all believers in Christ with all its attending blessings um, by Dr. Alvin J. McLean. Paul said that he knew that they were brothers because God chose them. Paul's knowing came from the Thessalonians' doings. He could see in their life the evidence that they were saved. I'm going to, in today's message, at each point, I'm going to ask a question that hopefully we can think about in our own lives. Are others thankful for you? Paul was just so bubbly thankful that all the work that he poured into these believers, that he's seen results. And, and so, are there people who look at your life, maybe they know your testimony, and they other that's a pretty radical thing. And, and those who are left behind don't understand it. And there's a lot of confusion and problem with all that. I tried to come up with some other worldly illustration. And it would be like, how do you tell somebody in our state that we're wrong? Ohio State's not the good guys, it's really Michigan. That would get violent, I think. And, <laughs> And, uh, and maybe in some worlds that's just as bad. But there's great power seen in the gospel of Jesus. So here's a good question. Is God's power seen in my life? What is God doing in my life that makes a difference for me? Maybe for other people as well. Pretty important stuff to think about. In verses 6 through 10, uh, it starts to show you how the church is forming and flourishing. And in verse 6, he actually says that you became imitators of us. So the, Thessal the Thessalonian Christians started to imitate Paul and Silas and Timothy and whoever else were on their team uh, as they were saying, oh, that's what it's like to have the Christian life. That's what it's like to, to live this way. The word there for imitators uh, could be followers. Uh, some would use the word mimics. Uh, they actually mimicked what they were doing. And the scriptures tell us throughout the New Testament that, there, that Christians do imitate others. Some of the categories are Christians are to imitate God, Christ, the apostles, church leaders, or even other godly Christians. That's what we do. We learn by being with each other and seeing how we go through life together. And, and then we try to live in similar kinds of patterns. These believers were changed. The word of God came into their life and they were changed. They were totally different than they were before they heard that message. So a quote today, uh, I was just zipping through Facebook really quick this morning. I don't do that all the time, honest. But... Um, some, one of my friends had a quote on there from A.W. Tozier and said this, If we are not changed by grace, then we are not saved by grace. There's got to be something that's different about you today than it was the day before you knew Christ. There's got to be something that uh, has impacted your life and made a change. There's got to be something that causes you to be distinct because you know Jesus and you've been saved from your sins. The word changed these people. When I say the word, Paul probably went there and I'm sure he used the Old Testament. 
But he, he used the Old Testament to tell them uh, the fact that there would be a Messiah, and this is what he's going to be like. But then he used his experience to say, and this is how Jesus fulfilled all that. So that's what changed them. It also tells us in verse 6 that um, you did all this in spite of severe suffering, and you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. They were suffering, and we don't know what that meant. It, it possibly could have been that they were being shunned. Families didn't want anything to do with them again. Uh, people would not do business with them. Maybe they were getting hurt economically. Uh, they were being shunned. That's one level. It may even have gone beyond that to where they were being persecuted and, and physically harmed and tortured. But whatever was going on for them, it was severe, and they welcomed the message with joy. Whatever it was, it did not cause them to abandon their faith and their belief in Jesus as a resurrected Savior. Dr. Mayhew says this about joy. It's the deep, abiding, inner thankfulness and gratitude to God, which is not interrupt, interrupted when undesirable life circumstances intrude. Joy is that peace and that thankfulness that I have inside that it doesn't matter what's going on in the rest of the world. That's not going to impact that. It's not going to change. I'm connected to God, and nothing can sever that. So afflictions become opportunities for us in our lives. Well, it tells us that um, these believers, in verse 7, became a model. They became models. But the word there is tupas, and, and tupas is a word that we would take into English and would just say type. They became a type. Um, it's, uh, it literally means the impression made by a blow. I remember when one of the factories that I worked in once, uh, we were doing this uh, big bursa machine that was stamping out um, metal plates, and, and one of the guys was running the machine, and I kind of did fixing. There were a couple of us that would fix machines if something went wrong. It was really easy. You just hit it with a hammer, and it works. And, um, and anyhow, this guy came to me and he said, there's something wrong with my machine. Okay, what's wrong with it? And he said, all the plates that are coming out have a crack in them. And I think there's something wrong with the machine, too much pressure or something like that. It's like, wow. And I looked at it and it was true. These little plates, these are the things you put over your register vent, you know, in your carpet. And, and it just have a line through it, just this one line. And I thought, I wonder what the the pattern, you know, the, the mold has on it. So I got underneath it and I looked up and there was a hair on there. There was one hair and it was just putting a little stripe down there. Whatever's in the pattern is gonna show up in the product. And, and that's what Paul, was, that's the same concept of what Paul was saying. You became a pattern for other people. So Christ obviously is the ultimate. Paul and his team were following Jesus and, and trying to pattern their lives after him. We sang, I want to be like Christ. And these believers fell in love with Jesus and they were patterning themselves after Paul and, and Timothy and Silas. And people were getting saved and following them as well. So the pattern, that form, that, that uh, mold has to be good has to be really good because whatever flaws we have in it are going to show up on the, on the end product that it comes afterwards. The message that they had was that Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and coming again. And it says that spread throughout all of them, Macedonia and Achaia. Macedonia was the northern region, Achaia was the southern region, and it went everywhere. It went beyond their city. It went beyond their region. It went beyond their nation. It went international. They were known for their faith. That's a great thing. Our church is known uh, for many things. Uh, and I like to think that we're somewhat known in our community, but uh, I know that there are some places you can go in the world. If you go to the Central African Republic, 
And you mentioned Rickman and some of the people from our church, they will love you forever. <laughs> That's a good thing there. Um, I don't know, I hope there's no places we can go where they would pick up stones and try to, I hope not, I don't know. <clears throat> All of that, they became living letters of Jesus Christ. All of that, having only been believers for a year or less. That's a little bit convicting. It tells us in verse 9 that they turned around. They went from idols, and you know what an idol is. It could, it's anything. It could be an attitude. It could be a belief. But it's the, anything that takes us away from God is an idol. And they had physical idols, and they left those lifeless, counterfeit idols, and they turned to the living and the true God. Now, most of us would say, well, man, we don't have idols in the United States. I read a story about a guy from China that came to the United States, and he told this American that I've seen in the United States that you have idols. No, we don't. Yes, you do. You have three. Really? Yeah. He said, a fat man in a red suit, you worship a rabbit, and in the fall you sacrifice turkey. Uh, well, maybe we do have idols. I don't know. They turned from those idols and they served a living God. And as they served the living God, they waited for the Son of God to come back from heaven. That has to do with the anticipation and expectation. Um, that's a phrase that's only used here in all the New Testament about them uh, waiting for, for the Son to come. They waited, they're waiting for Jesus to return. Jesus told his followers in John chapter 14 that I was going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to come back and receive you again. In Acts chapter 1 verse 11, there was an angel that was seated there when Jesus ascended into heaven and he told the followers that the way Jesus left is the same way he's going to come back and receive you to himself. And in verse 10, it says, They wait for Jesus from heaven, uh, whom he was raised from the dead. Jesus, who rescues us. He rescues us. He's going to deliver us. There's two ways that can be understood, the rescuing. There's two ways that happens. One is by evacuation. The other is by exemption. He can rescue you in the middle of a problem by grabbing you and taking you out of that. Or he could rescue you by not having you go through that problem. The context really doesn't help us here uh, in which it means. Uh, it just says that he's going to rescue us from the coming wrath. And the word there for wrath is the word orge. Um, there's three words that I found that's been translated wrath. One of them, I think, just means anger, you know, normal, everyday anger. But there's two that are kind of unique. Orge is one of them. But my I found that the only time this word is used, it's usually used of God. And the conclusion I have on that is because God alone is the only one who can get this level of angry and not sin. That he's righteous enough that he can be there. Uh, I think that it's talking about exemption. That, um, that we can be exempt from God's anger. Verses 9 and 10 kind of illustrate verse 3. Remember when I told you about their faith and their love and their hope? Uh, it illustrates that. Uh, their work of faith helped them turn from idols. Their labor of love causes them, motivates them to serve uh, the living God. And their enduring hope has them waiting for the Son of Jesus uh, to come. So the question to ask here is, do I make it easier for others to think about Jesus? Does my life prompt other people to think about spiritual things at all? Hopefully it does. So let me give you a little bit of a summary of um, the believers of, in Thessalonica. We're going to go into this more and more in the next couple weeks, but the Thessalonians the believers were truly generated, regenerated people. They were saved. And they shared the gospel wherever they went. They were free to tell people about Jesus. And therefore, they reproduced themselves spiritually. They saw other people come to Christ. They 
were able to uh, help them know, and, and it was personal and corporate growth for them. So they followed Christ and they lived for him. And that's exactly what God wants you and I to do. We are to follow Christ and live for him. With all the suffering they went through, Christians have no business being discouraged, defeated, or despairing. Not if we remember the truth of God's word and the promises of what he has for us today and down in the future. God's still calling you and I back to his fundamentals of his faith, his hope, his love, and he wants us to walk faithfully with him. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Thank you that we too can be people of faith and that we can uh, be challenged by what you have done for us, motivated to go on and to love and serve you and to serve others. God, it is true that you desire for us to have a passion for you and a compassion for people. And these believers got that, they caught that at an early point in their lives. Lord, help us to live lives that do attract others to you. And we will give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.